All right, so where can we find the cultural shaping of cognition? In uh, my book, I suggest that there is a remarkable body of research out there that uh, points to mental illnesses. They're not, as sometimes assumed, spread evenly around the globe in, in similar uh, conceptions. They have, in fact, appeared in different cultural forms over both time and place. Uh, the social uh, beliefs of discrete cultures the forms of madness from one place to another in history often look remarkably different from those in another. So medical historian Edward Shorter says that uh, different places and different times have different symptom pools. And symptom pools are not random. People at a given moment in history in need of expressing their psychological distress will have a limited number of symptoms to choose from. Uh, and he calls those symptom pools. So how does one symptom end up in one symptom pool of one time and not in the symptom pool of another time? He suggests that uh, you can look to the uh, key players are often the healers. They're the uh, priests, the shamans, the doctors, the researchers, and potentially in the future, the AI-assisted diagnostics. And these experts propose theories about how the mind works and then look for the symptoms that confirm those theories. This is how Edward Shorter put it, puts it. He says, patients unconsciously endeavor to produce symptoms that will correspond to the medical diagnostics of the time. This sort of cultural molding of the unconscious happens imperceptibly and follows a large number of cultural cues that the patient is simply not aware of. So this is, a, this is e a easy, easier to see when we look back in history. This is a famous picture of a hysterical patient fainting in the arms of a famous healer. And the question really becomes, would this particular uh, symptom of fainting been uh, uh, demonstrated without the uh, expectations of those healers? So we can look back in history. We can see hysteria is sort of shaped by cultural conceptions of, uh, uh, of women's sexuality, women's physiology. Uh, and then the question becomes, does this happen in our time? It's the cultural shaping of symptoms. And indeed, uh, it is. Let's take one example that I go into in depth in the book, which is PTSD. If uh, uh, 1.2 million veterans returning home, clearly men, many of them suffering from the hypervigilance, easily startled flashbacks, the anxiety that are our symptomology for PTSD. But the simple but mind-bending truth is that mental illness such as PTSD are not are both culturally shaped and utterly real to the sufferer. Um, McGill University medical anthropologist Alan Young explains that. A diagnosis of PTSD can be real in a particular place and time and yet not true for all places and times. So to make the case that uh, PTSD is indeed culturally shaped and our conceptions of it do not, are not universal, I took a long look at the Boxing Day tsunami uh, of 2004, both before and after we in the West sent uh, all sorts of trauma counselors there. Uh, you know, we did, uh, we did art therapy, uh, we did guided visualizations. We had the Scientologists were on the scene, the thought field therapists, the rapid by eye movement therapists, the critical incident debriefers, on and on. And most carried with them the Western checklist of PTSD of what they were looking for as a as the appropriate reaction or that's to to trauma. And despite the certainty of these healers, the truth is that PTSD symptoms checklist does not account for the various pathological reactions to trauma in different cultures or in different times. Meaning matters after a, a tragic event. And around the world, you can find a multiplicity of reactions. So in Cambodia, for Cambodian refugees, um, often after they fled their civil war, they would describe um, pressing psychological impact of trauma being related to the vis being visited by vengeful spirits and the feeling of intense dread and distress that they had not been able to perform rituals for their dead in, uh, Salvadorian women will, will describe a feeling of intense heat in the body. People in Afghanistan will talk about a type of nervous anger and the sensation of internal stress and press, pressure. So symptoms vary. Uh, the Western view of PTSD is not universal. Going back to uh, uh, Sri Lanka, and this, of course, is going to sound very familiar after you heard Professor Marcus's talk. By and large, people in Sri Lanka did not report reactions to trauma in line with those uh, internal states in, of the mind, anxiety, fear, numbing, and the like. They talked about the primary symptom in terms of the negative consequences that an event like the tsunami had in terms of the damage it did to their roles and relationships. So the damage was 
in their sociocentric self, not in their egocentric self. So symptoms vary across history as well. For PTSD, if you were a British soldier in the Boer Wars and had a negative reaction to that to battle, you were likely to complain of joint pain and muscle weakness, so a sort of more somatic display. It was a con condition their doctors called debility syndrome. Soldiers in the American Civil War uh, often reacted to the psychological trauma of the battle by experiencing an uh, aching in the left side of the chest and having the feeling of, an, uh, of uh, intense homesickness. That was labeled DeCosta syndrome. Soldiers in the First World War uh, uh, experienced shell shock, which uh, had a lot of physiological symptoms, uh, uh, nervous tics, uncontrollable body movements, physical paralysis. All of these things were tied to the, those, the conceptions of the mind that existed in those times. So mental health symptoms can be seen as kind of type of a language of suffering. And you only speak the language of your time because uh, you want to be understood. And here's where uh, Professor Marcus beat me to the punch, unfortunately, with the Weirdest People in the World paper, which I highly recommend you read, Behavioral and Brain Scientists, three great researchers. If you want a, a gloss on it, you can uh, read my piece in Pacific Standard, who I profiled those professors. It's a remarkable paper, and it really is a deep dive into the ways we're learning that cultures indeed shape cognitions on almost every way we are studying it. And up till now, some, some ridiculous number, like 90% of the studies have been done on freshman and sophomore college students in psychology classes with the assumption that we are seeing the internal hardware of the mind. And when you take these studies across cultures, studies about fairness, sense of self, obedience to authority, how we perceive and describe the natural world, the way we infer the motivations of others, how we categorize things, moral reasoning, spatial reasoning, all of these things were shaped by culture. We thought it was the hardware, and in fact, it's, it's, it's culture, it, our, our minds have learned to let culture lead us in life's dance. And it, it, just to go, go on just a little bit about the weird paper, just to point out how weird we are. Um, we're weird in America, you know, Western educated. Do you have it? She had a better slide too, I'm, I'm feeling really. But um, the, the one line that caught me in the paper was, American participants, they said, are exceptional even within the uh, population of Westerners. We are outliers among outliers. Um, so given the data, they conclude that social scientists could not possibly have picked a worse population from which to draw broad generalizations. <laughs> Researchers have been doing the equivalent of studying penguins while believing they are learning insights applicable to the average bird, and we are the penguins. So uh, to conclude, understanding the cultural impact of the human cognition and the cultural shaping of it is just at the beginning. We're just at the beginning of this, and it's really interesting that AI is coming onto the scene just as we're learning to, to rethink about that human cognition doesn't just happen up here, it happens in relationship to cultures and it goes very deep and it shapes us very deeply. And, uh, and of course, this, I hope this will become a, a really important topic for AI as we learn, uh, teach computer systems to mimic reasoning, thought uh, processes and intuition. And that's where I'll end. Thank you so much. Thank you.